the 23rd of March 2020, normal life in Britain came to an abrupt halt. The coronavirus is the biggest threat this country has faced for decades. All over the world we're seeing the devastating impact of this invisible killer. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. In an effort to stop the spread of COVID-19, millions of people were forced to work remotely or were furloughed. Overnight, towns and cities across the UK fell silent. The massive shift in work and travel patterns had a hidden impact on our energy system. The way that we both used and produced electricity changed dramatically. What we learned could help shape the energy system of the future. COVID was actually a very uh, interesting period for the electricity system. We can think of it as a glimpse of the future low carbon, even zero carbon system. During the first lockdown in Britain, electricity demand fell to levels not seen since the 1980s. Many factories, shops and offices were no longer drawing power from the grid. But in our homes, it was a very different story. Given we were all at home, it's obvious that we consumed more electricity. If we look at total weekly consumption, it went up by 10%. And within the day, this increase happened at different times. So in the morning, when normally everyone would be uh, rushing to uh, leave to work and to put the kettle on and to cook breakfast, that moment of the day where we use more electricity generally happened a little later. At the same time, in the evenings, we usually also have a peak in electricity consumption, and that peak was a little earlier. So what happened is probably some of what we were consuming in the evening when you put your washing on or your dishwasher, you would be doing that throughout the day because everyone was at home. Avoiding these usual peaks in demand and using a lot less electricity overall across the economy meant that some of the most polluting sources of power could be switched off. What little demand remained could mostly be met by renewables, clean sources of power like wind and solar. Electricity is traded in a market, so when demand goes down, the bits of supply that, that get um, rejected, as it were, are the most expensive bits. So in a wind farm, once you've built it, um, there's very little cost associated with operating. So if the wind's blowing, you let the wind farm operate and uh, produce electricity, and then you sell it for whatever you can get. Whereas with a gas-fired power station, you actually have to pay to buy gas to burn to turn into electricity. So the gas comes off the system first when, when demand reduces. It decarbonized our, our grid somewhat, but um, there are some technical challenges associated with the mix which, which constrain that a bit. These technical challenges relate to the stability of the electricity system. In simple terms, stability is achieved when supply and demand are in balance, and the electrical frequency of the grid is maintained at steady level. Instability can lead to blackouts, so getting this balance right is an important task for National Grid's control room. One of the key ways of maintaining stability has traditionally been to make use of something called inertia. The kinetic energy stored in large rotating generators. This irons out imbalances and absorbs faults on the system. The problem is, renewables don't provide this inertia, so National Grid's engineers had to come up with other solutions to avoid instability. Well, we could reach instability when there is a sudden um, generation demand imbalance. So when we suddenly lose a generator in the system, that could cause instability. And the bigger that generator is, the higher the challenge. Therefore, one of these measures was to sign a bilateral contract with a big nuclear plant. And through this contract, the power output of that plant was reduced. So in simple terms, we reduced the risk of that instability happening. Uh, on the other hand, some other measures that were, were taken were to increase the, the services that can actually help us guarantee stability. 
So even if something wrong goes on, even if we lose one large generator, there are some services that react to that. And what was done was basically to increase the inertia in the system. And that was done by simply turning on gas plants, uh, more gas plants that we would actually need just for energy. That has many unwanted consequences. The first one is that there is an increased cost when you turn on those gas plants just for these stability reasons, but also you contribute to emissions. So for the future, we can learn from this period and actually try to find ways to deal with uh, stability in a highly renewable grid, but in a more cost-effective manner. We're unlikely to see such extreme lockdown conditions repeated, but many of us, particularly those who can't walk or cycle to work, are likely to keep working from home in the future, at least for a couple days a week. So the big question is, will this shift in working patterns make the transition to a greener economy easier to achieve? Well, it's a little bit more complex than it first seems. One of the complicating factors is electric vehicles. This whole ability to work um, outside of the workplace, uh, but equally to shop outside of the shop, to be able to socialize virtually, all of these which are fundamentally a digitalization of your activity participation, mean that uh, where people do different things has been evolving. And as these patterns change, it affects where energy is consumed and where travel demand is manifested and where electric vehicles are charged. If an individual is working from home, that means the vehicle, if it was that was an electric vehicle, for instance, um, would be uh, plugged in at home and not at the workplace. The interesting thing about being able to simulate all of this in, in, a, in a model is that you can see what's the relative impact. So, for instance, we find that um, if you have um, all workers working from home versus critical workers working from home, the difference in energy consumption is actually quite marginal. But if you had a scenario with electric vehicles, the difference in energy, increase in energy uh, demand is almost 10x in the sense that if you have um, people working from home, if, you, if that's an increase of energy consumption about 4 to 5%, the corresponding increase in energy consumption with uh, electric vehicles is about 40%. So there's an almost 10x difference in the scale we're talking about. It really does matter where those electric vehicles are plugged in and where they're demanding um, energy, electricity effectively, because that's a huge um, draw on, on the grid. The UK's COVID-19 lockdown gave us a glimpse of a future energy system dominated by renewables and the challenges that that might bring to our electricity system operators. As we move towards a greener society, the things we do every day, how we work, where we shop, how we get to places, are changing. They're becoming more digitalized and dependent on electricity. Understanding how trends, like working from home and electrification of transport, interact, will help us plan for an energy system that meets our needs without costing the earth.